Hello everyone. Uh, today, as promised, I'm going to to talk about Victorian poetry. So we did talk with the with uh, with the first part of your group earlier today uh, a bit about Victorian writing, and we will uh, and we'll continue this. So we will begin with context and conditions for Victorian writing. So if you want to take notes, take notes. But the video will be online, so you'll be will be able to watch it once again. Right. So the term Victorian age uh, or Victorian era uh, is normally used to cover a huge time span. Oh, sorry. So where is the tool? A huge time span between. 1837 and 1901, so roughly 60 years of English history, the most part of 19th century in England is the Victorian age. Is the Victorian age. And uh, oh, anyway, when we're talking about English literature of the, oh, of the 19th century, we are mostly talking about the Victorian. Uh, uh, the Queen, who, who reigned at that time, Queen Victoria, uh, achieved by the time of her death in 1901 the status of the one that had, well, that had Queen Elizabeth I before her. And now probably Queen Elizabeth II has now. And of course, uh, the Victorian era is not simply the reigning monarch. It's the whole set of ideas, set of moral and cultural philosophies, uh, ways of life, attitudes, that were, of course, reflected in literature. So, uh, so first of all, let's talk about economic contexts of Victorian literature. Uh, in terms of economy, England at that time is a booming nation. Uh, it's the beginning of industry as we understand it now. It's the decline of agriculture, uh, with a lot of cheap corn, cheap food coming from North America, from Eastern Europe, from India, uh, from all over across the globe. Uh, what does it result in? Those people living in the country, in England, are getting poorer, because they, well, they, their products are more expensive than the ones, let's say, bought in Russia. Uh, at the very same time, those who live in cities benefit from cheap food. For, uh, for the same money you can buy roughly more cakes, you can buy jam, you can buy tea. So you basically live a better life. When you have quite a lot to eat, when you can afford a modest living or even a house, when you can buy better clothes than you normally used, used to buy, you start living a better life. If you are living a better life, you want things which, are, which go a bit further than food. You want art, you want beauty, you want, and you want to read something else. Uh, again, the city population increased. Uh, uh, when Queen Victoria began her reigning career in 9, 1837, the population of London was about 2 million people, which is not particularly big for a metropolitan capital. By 1901, the population of London was six and a half million. It basically doubled. In, in over 60 years' time, with huge mortality rate uh, in infant mortality, it is, it is very remarkable. Uh, again, the life in London was pretty much the same as we would understand life in the big city now. So people do all sorts of jobs, they have various facilities, they have somewhere to go, they can go somewhere to have, to have a free, to spend some time, and quality time, and they have interests, the interests that you as modern people would have. Uh, again, Britain became smaller, not in terms of territory, it was actually growing, but in terms of transport. Uh, uh, use of railways and the introduction of railways, uh, a use of steam engines to power the trains, to power the ships, uh, made, made traveling around Britain a very simple task. So you, you didn't have to travel for several days 
to get from, say, London to Edinburgh. Uh, or, uh, or spend the whole day traveling from London to Oxford. You could now do this in several hours, which was a significant improvement. Uh, what is more, uh, a, uh, you could transport goods faster. You could communicate the information faster, uh, simply, uh, simply because at the end of the century you have telephone invented, and early in the century you have the telegraph. So news travels a lot. The postal service travels very quickly, thanks to trains, thanks to steamships. Uh, uh, again, the uh, widespread of printing also resulted in the decline of illiteracy. In other words, more people could read. If you have a reading population, it means that you can, uh, not you simply can, you have to supply this population with the stuff to read. In other words, you have to make papers, you have to make uh, books, you have to write them, you have to write poetry, uh, so whatever, anything. Uh, and of course, this was a big challenge for uh, for writers, for poets, for journalists, because people were hungry for information, they were hungry for reading, and you had to somehow deal with this hunger. And literature is not something that you okay, that you can buy abroad, like food or um, or let's say uh, consumer goods. You have to manufacture it at home. Again. So this was the positive side, now you have the negative side. Huge social progress also resulted in, in this sharp divide inside English society. Uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who was at the time the Prime Minister of England and, and also a um, lovely poet and, and a writer too, uh, published a novel, which, which was, not, was not a particularly good novel, but still a very important one, called Sibyl. And in this novel, Sibyl, oh, he writes that now we have two nations, the rich and the poor. Those who are rich are becoming richer and richer and richer. Those who are poor simply cannot get out of poverty. And this was a dilemma. Uh, uh, at the very same time, you uh, you have a very peculiar type of monarch who uh, set a very peculiar example of how a moral and acceptable social life should be led. Uh, Queen Victoria. Uh, gave birth to, well, to a lot of children and uh, lived uh, and was a happy wife of Prince Albert. Um, unfortunately, and, and they, were, uh, they were considered to be a beautiful couple and an exemplary couple, uh, so th a kind of royal family that other royal families should look at and other noble and noble families should, should look at. Uh, everybody observing their duty, being nice and pleasant in polite society, and so on and so forth. Prince Albert dies, uh, well, uh, very, uh, well, in about middle of Queen Victoria's reign. And, and Queen Victoria m mourns him forever. So she, wants, uh, she wears black up until her death for her husband. For 30 years, she moved, um, at least openly. Uh, she created a, uh, well, a pavilion, to, well, which was dedicated to him. Uh, so she sets an example of a morally correct person. And as a result, uh, well, this sort of attitude keeping appearances, being nice and pleasant, uh, results in, uh, in other people doing pretty much the same. So, on the, uh, in your own home, you can, you, could do all, you can do all sorts of things. You can, 
misbehave, you can beat your wife, you can obsessively drink, you can you can in, get involved in all sorts of sexual sexually perverted practices. Do whatever, but nobody should know. And this uh, uh, this contrast between keeping Victorian appearances being moral on the surface and not particularly moral when no when nobody sees. Uh, has become a problem. If you remember when we talked about Charles Dickens, especially when we talked about, about Bleak House, uh, when we had the detective character said, well look, I know that you are this lovely lady, but you have your dirty secrets and I'm going to uncover them. So pretty much the same thing happened here. Um, uh, again, uh, another Another big dilemma, another big uh, conflict inside the English society is uh, the introduction of really progressive steps towards making English society a better society. So, in uh, 1855, slavery was abolished in England. So you couldn't have a slave. Even those, those people who were brought from East India, from Africa, from uh, India, from all over across, across the globe, were set free. They were free people uh, since 1855. Uh, in 1829, the, uh, the restrictions uh, for Catholics were lifted, so it was no longer... So being a Catholic stopped being dangerous. At the very same time, uh, Brit uh, those people who were running Britain at that time exploited uh, those who lived in the colonies. Ordinary working class people were exploited. And that, and that was a big social problem. You talk about a democratic society, you talk about freedoms, you talk about suffrage, which is giving human rights to people. And at the very same time, you deprive the people of those rights. Which is uh, which again uh, gives um, gives some fuel for social conflict. Uh, how, uh, however, uh, these social conflicts did not uh, actually uh, result in large scale revolutions or, or uprisings in England. If in 1848 the whole of Europe was inflamed with revolutionary wars. In England, nothing happened. Uh, all those uh, people asking for human rights, campaigning for human rights, were suppressed, were kept at bay. Uh, but if though these forces uh, are kept at bay uh, in, on, in the political sphere, they should come out somewhere, and they came out in literature, and they came out in art. Uh, we will mostly talk about literature now, but uh, again, Victorian art is a very, and Victorian literature too, are very good examples of how those social problems become noted, how they, how they become explored by writers, by poets, by artists. Uh, again, um, if we look at the cultural uh, life of that period, we, uh, we will see that the beginning of Victorian uh, literature and Victorian attitudes to, to it starts as early as the late 1820s. So, in the late 1820s, we see the deaths of uh, George Gordon Byron, Keats and Shelley. So Walter Scott dies later, but still uh, very, very near to that period. Uh, we can say that English romantics, I mean the romantic movement in England, quite literally dies out. Well, the most important representatives die. Uh, as a result, we have a kind of cultural and literary void and kind of emptiness that should be filled with some, with somebody, with people who, uh, who, uh, who want to either continue uh, what, the, what their predecessors did or do something else. So, uh, 
And here we move to the second part of our talk, which will be exact directly on poetry. So before we actually, well, even though I labeled uh, the Victorian poet, poets Victorians, they did not perceive themselves as Victorians when they were writing. They, they never said, oh, well, I'm a Victorian, that's why I'm right, so and so. Very much, uh, in the very much same sense, the Romantics didn't say, oh, we are the Romantics and we write in this manner because we are the Romantics. Nobody labeled them as such at the time when they were around, so they were labeled quite later. Uh, again, so they are, in a sense, constructed categories, which means that uh, when, at the point when they were actually writing uh, Dover Beach in memoriam, a break, break, break the poems that we talked about, or were supposed to talk about, uh, they never considered them to be something specifically reflecting the spirit of their age, not at least at, at the beginning. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, a very prominent literary scholar, uh, Mill, uh, points out that Victorian poets uh, were distinguished in a very remarkable manner from the times which preceded them. So we can talk about Tennyson, Arnold, Browning uh, as Victorian poets simply because they wrote differently. If we put uh, like side by side a poem written by the Romantics, any of them, or and a, and a poem written by any of the Victorians, we will see sharp contrast, we will see a different mindset, we will see different set of ideas, and uh, we will see different techniques given. So, uh, the first thing, uh, the first thing that we have to remember is is this. So uh, the Victorian uh, uh, the Victorian approach, uh, the Victorian aesthetics, develops in the context of Romanticism. So uh, for many of the Victorians, the, of the Victorians, the Romantics were a big thing. They were an example to follow. For example, when young Tennyson uh, was writing his first poems, he was very much inspired by his romantic predecessors. When, um, when Robert Browning uh, first opened, first read uh, poems by Percy Shelley when he was 14 and he uh, re recollects it in his diary, he immediately became a great fan of Shelley. Uh, he even wrote that Shelley is a key to the to a new world for him, which is again a very a very striking uh, example of, of of how the continuity between the Romantics and the Victorian Victorians remains. So, again, uh, another again a very striking example which shows that the Victorians were in a very at a very, at, at a certain point in their professional careers, very romantic people. Romantic, not in the sense of having romantic feelings in their hearts, but romantics in the in their aesthetics. Uh, so, at the age of fourteen, again, fourteen, a pivotal age forever for many people. Uh, Tennyson is uh, is fourteen, and that at that time, Byron dies. So it's uh, eighteen. Uh, so 1824. And again, Tennyson writes that, well, he felt that the world had come to an end. So it's the end of the world. Byron is dead. Well, heck, how can you live on? <laughs> and uh, he remembers carving in stone in huge block capitals, Byron is dead. And later, when Tennyson goes to Cambridge, uh, he uh, uh, and meets his long, t long time friend Arthur, ha uh, Arthur Hallam, so the person mentioned in, in memoriam AAH. So, uh, Hallam, who is not a particularly good poet, 
but is a brilliant critic of poetry. Puts Tennyson in the same school as Keats and Shelley. So, oh, well, you're like Keats and Shelley. You're pretty much on the same scale. And again, it shows the continuity. Even though uh, the Romantics tried to distance themselves from, uh, well, the Victorians tried to distance themselves from the Romantics, saying, no, we are different, we write about different things, we look at the world in a different way. Early Victorians, the first generation of Victorians, uh, saw themselves as the continuation of the Romantic tradition. So it doesn't switch off like of Romantics on Victorian. It was a gradual, tra uh, a gradual transition from one uh, approach to writing to another. Uh, again, uh, if if the, if the first generation of Romantics, meaning Byron, Shelley, Keats, had not died at a young age, this, di uh, this divide wouldn't have been that sharp. And we have the divide between the Romantic and the Victorian simply because we did not see quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of poets of the Victorian era, of the, uh, of the Romantic age, to mature, to become really mature poets. Uh, another important thing to, to say about Victorian poetry is that unlike the Romantic, its Romantic counterpart, it is in the shade of the novel. If you remember our previous lectures, we talked about Dickens quite a lot, yeah? Uh, so, Dickens is this big, big figure like Tolstoy for Russian literature, and or Dostoevsky. And novel is this big thing. People want a story, uh, and they uh, and stories, well, short stories, novels are simply easier to read uh, because they do not require uh, a certain skill or a certain mood. You don't read poetry every day, and ordinary people, uh, well, who are who really try to get on with their lives, do not always have time and. Moral energy to sit at a poem, read it, and then brood about it. Well, no, 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 not all, not all of us. Oh well, I I'm more than sure that not everyone really feels that. Well, today is the good day for poetry. Well, you don't feel very much in, into reading poetry or, or on a gloomy Monday morning when you have to go to university. So again, the novel is the big thing, is the big genre, and uh, it. And the poetry is somehow in the shade. If we look at the Victorian age, we don't see a lot of novel writing there. Only with Walter Scott closer to the end of the, of the, uh, of the, of the Romantic era, we have the historical novel with Ivan Hoe and, uh, and, and, and the such. Uh, or very niche things like uh, like Frank Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. So the, uh, so the novel is there, but the poetry, unlike the novel, is often very uh, uh, is often more advanced in the topics it can look at. And uh, there are two explanations. First of all, well, there is an economic explanation, well, which has. Uh, a lot of purely with economy. The second one is a more well, liter uh, well, a more uh, literature related one. So if we look at the economy, books are still expensive, but but there are but there are libraries, uh, and in order to get your book into a circulating library, so the library where you can borrow a book, uh, leave a kind of deposit, a sum of money just to make sure that you will not steal the book, which you will get upon, upon return. Your novel has to be decent. It has to be suited for young ladies. And you remember, we have Victorian values. So you cannot write about passionate love. You cannot make hints about sensual things or sex. You cannot write about love and violence. Uh, you cannot write about certain socially, uh, well, well, uh, uh, so, so certain topics 
that have social importance, like human rights. Uh, so, you, you, in other words, certain topics cannot be simply covered by a novel. And here comes poetry, because poetry collections are usually thinner, they are cheap, where you can buy them, you can see them published in journals, and, uh, and what is more, you can get them, well, by other means, outside libraries, you can even buy them. And again, you can come to a reading of poetry, uh, which again is a very uh, is a very good option because very often poetry is meant to be heard, not to be read. The second ex uh, the second uh, well explanation is a literary one. Uh, the people involved in poetry writing at that time, uh, not all of them, but most of them were uh, people with a lot of ideas and they wanted to share them. Uh, I mean so I mean ideas about social reform, about well all sorts of things. And uh, and again they tried writing a different sort of poem. A sort of poem that an ordinary person would understand and an ordinary person would sympathize with. Again, and you have two poetries in a sense. You have the poetry for a more uh, refined sort of people, and you have a po and you have poetry for more ordinary sort of reader, which again is a uh, is uh, is a very good marketing move. Uh, if you if you are like a simpler person, you want about you want to read about simpler things. Here you here you are. You you, you get your simple poetry. If you're into more sophisticated things, fine, you have more sophisticated poems, which again uh, very, uh, very clearly shows this problem that, that uh, was earlier mentioned in the lecture, the one covered in Disraeli's Sibyl, the nation of the rich and the nation of the poor. So uh, again, the poetry in itself uh, highlighted this contrast, this huge divide, split in the English society. So, uh, if we look at Victorian theory of, po of, of poetry, we will again see that nothing was very straightforward and nothing was simple. Uh, uh, the Victorians were, uh, le uh, were left with a very interesting approach to aesthetics of poetry. So, uh, well, to the answer to the question, what is beautiful poetry? Uh, something that was strange, extraordinary, exotic, that was beautiful. Remember uh, Byron or remember Coleridge. You, have, you need to have big emotions. Again, remember Coleridge, the albatross. Uh, you uh, you had to do with well you at the very same time if you look at w w Wordsworth you had to write in simpler English simple you have to write in simpler language about exotic things and big passions well it's a bit of a hard task um, so uh, the Victorians developed a slightly different sort of aesthetics. Uh, basically, we have two types of Victorian poem. The one with a lot of uh, elements, Baroque elements, detail, well, tiny detail, well, beautiful descriptions, more narrative poems with a dramatic monologue. And at the very same time, at the other edge, we have very straightforward poems which, uh, which serve to, um, to convey the mainstream politics of the period. And here we look at Rudyard Kipling at the poem If, which is a very good example of how using simple language you can actually convey big political ideas. Uh, uh, so, um, there, um, the approach to sensibility in poetry also changed. 
in the in the Romantic age, poetry, even though it was very sensual, very laden, very much laden with emotion, it was still considered to be something only men are capable of. You don't see a lot of women romantic poets. I guess there are none. If we look at the Victorian age, we see a significant shift in uh, in looking well at poetry. So since poetry, again, it is very much in line with the ideas of the Victorian era. Emotions are something uh, are something that is reserved for women, because the men, since they are gentlemen, have to keep a stiff upper lip, meaning. They do not show emotion, they are, they keep like their appearances under pressure, so they are tough. And men are, uh, so men are tough and manly, women are womanly, and well, they can shed an occasional tear and be emotional. Well, what do, it, well, what can you take from a silly woman? Yeah? Uh, well, again, it's the Victorian era. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm sharing this point with you. So, uh, hence, we have two types of poetry. We have a very masculine type of poetry, which we see, for example, in Rudyard Kipling, with the emotional parts being reserved to female poetry. So at that very point, in the Victorian age, we, we see this sharp division. Poetry written by men and for men, and poetry written by women for women. Again, uh, a striking example is this team of Robert Browning, uh, who was considered to be one of the three biggest names in Victorian poetry, and his wife, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who was a beautiful poet, well, she was a beautiful woman, to be, well, to be frank, and she was an immensely talented poet. And in her lifetime, she was considered to be even more talented, talented than her husband and who again uh, um, touched upon a lot of issues about women's rights which were later raised in, the, in, the, uh, in modernism by Virginia Woolf, for example. So, uh, the first person we, we are going to talk about today is, uh, is Alfred Tennyson. Uh, so, uh, later Alfred Lord Tennyson. Uh, if you are talking about Victorian, Victorian literature, you have to talk about Dickens because it's prose and you have to talk about Tennyson because it's poetry. Looking at Tennyson, well, at Tennyson alone, we can pretty much understand how Victorian poetry developed. So, the, uh, Tennyson's key work is in memoriam A.H.H. So, the poem uh, uh, it's, not a, it's not a poem as such, rather it is, a con, it is a collection of closely linked poems. So the poem Break, Break, Break that we discussed earlier uh, we, with you is again one of the poems from this huge uh, collection, huge series of poems. So. Uh, <clears throat> The poem features the death of Arthur Henry Hallam. Uh, Arthur Hallam was a close friend of Tennyson, somebody who, in a sense, made his name as a poet. Uh, somebody who, uh, in a sense, again, um, uh, explained to the, to the Victorian society why Tennyson is so great. So he was not a very good poet, but he was a brilliant literary critic. And again, very much like uh, when we talked about the, uh, uh, the Romantic Age and talked about William Hazlitt, uh, the, um, the diarist and again, a literary critic, and, uh, and the essayist. We, uh, we have Hazlitt and the Romantics, we have Hallam and Tennyson. So like Bonnie, Clyde, Chip and Tail, so they, 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 they come in pairs. Uh, so Helen died in 1833 at the age of 22. So it was a very brief but a very intense friendship. 
I mean friendship in the good sense of the word. So uh, they met uh, at, Cambridge, uh, at Cambridge, I mean Tennyson and Helen, and somehow there was some mutual interest. And there was a lot of ex written exchange going on, a lot of intellectual exchange going on. So, uh, when Helen died, Tennyson felt very lonely. Uh, he, f uh, well, it was a big blow for him. And it was so deep that uh, he worked on In Memoriam for, well, for more than, well, well for about 20 years. So, he started in 1833 and finished in 1850. So he was still thinking and going over that death. So the poem was published first anonymously in, the, in, in, in 1850. And it showed how, ten, how not simply Tennyson's uh, attitude towards Hallam and towards this loss developed, but also how the sensibilities of doubt and despair, so how can you continue to live if the people you love go so quickly? And how, how can you, uh, uh, well, is happiness at all possible in a world where the, uh, the most loved people uh, die and nothing can be done? Uh, again, in, in the 19, uh, when the poem appeared, it, it very well fitted into this whole atmosphere of doubt and despair, since in 1850 is the, the, uh, 1850 is the year of the death of William Wordsworth, who was again the first great romantic poet, and with him the, rom uh, the romantic age died, and Helen dies, and Wordsworth dies, and for Tennyson, again, it was a very big, big emotion. So, again, our In Memoriam became a hugely popular poem. Especially, well, its best reader, its most ardent reader and most ardent fan was Queen Victoria. So, uh, after the death of her husband, Prince Albert, in 1861, uh, the whole country did go into this bit of melancholy. And Queen Victoria remained in this melancholy up until her death. And this melancholy tone, with a bit of self-pity, uh, uh, became, for a huge part of the Victorian era, the cornerstone of Victorian taste and Victorian sentiment. So. Uh, the Victorian age, well, at least the first part of it, is about melancholy. Uh, it's about loss, it's about sadness, and you, and you speak to yourself, of course, as well. Uh, and you sh sh shed an occasional tear if you're a woman. So, again, uh, the, uh, the lines from, uh, from In Memoriam, which you definitely have heard, and which became... Uh, ooh, well, how to put it, the motto of the Victorian age. I hold it true, whatever befall, I feel it when I sorrow most. This better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Again, well, good words. Well, it's, it's very simple. Well, it's better to love and lose a person than experience no love and consequently no loss. You might think, oh, but hold on, it's, it's a very romantic line, and of course it is, uh, since, it, uh, since here we see how the legacy of the romantic age still comes out in the Victorian, in, in this occasional line about emotion, about love and about self-pity. So, again, he, uh, later in Tennyson's poem, The Lady of Shallot, we have, again, this melancholy reinforced, and now reinforced by medieval legend. The Victorian age uh, goes further in romanticizing the, the Middle Ages. 
Uh, again, uh, mid the Middle Ages were seen again as an example of moral values, of piety. Well, it was the age where religion mattered. Of decent behavior. Well, you don't you. Well, you, you do not, well, at, at least in the Victorian age, you did not learn, uh, learn much about, well, all sorts of things, well, bad things and immoral things happening happening with medieval knights. No, no, they were decent people, according to the Victorians. And uh, this, ed uh, this melancholy attitude persists and persists and persists. Uh, we see this in... Um, in peripheral uh, poetry and painting, with all those nicely detailed pictures, well, of Gabriel Rossetti. So, if you are, if you can, well, I really suggest you go online and check some of the well, peripheral paintings, which are nearly photographic in their accurate descript, uh, accurate portrayal of uh, of medieval characters and Shakespeare and Shakespeare's characters. So. Uh, however, there is more than emotion and simple feeling in Tennyson's work. Well, Tennyson wouldn't have been Tennyson if he didn't have a second, uh, second layer, a double bottom. So, in his poem The Brook, he, he gives a first-person voice to a stream in a vision of eternity. For man may have come and man may go, but I go on forever. Again, uh, Tennyson's observation is very personal, it's very deeply felt, and in many ways it simplifies the world view of the Romantics. So the Romantics would have, uh, would have done this, but on a larger scale. Uh, uh, however, uh, Tennyson's and generally the Victorians uh, uh, Tennyson and the Victorians look at the nature from a completely different perspective. If for the Romantics nature is something that you praise, remember the daffodils, yeah? I wanted lonely as a cloud and you, well, you spot those daffodils and, well, simple flowers, but you are enchanted by them. For the Victorians nature is something that is dangerous something that is violent, something that is threatening. Again, the poem in memoriam has this lovely line about nature. Nature red in tooth and claws. So, uh, nature has red teeth and red claws, well, because they're covered with blood. Um, famously, Matthew Arnold uh, w uh, once walked into the woods in the north of England and ran out in dismay because he saw, well, he thought that there in the woods, well, you have this freedom with every tree having its place, whereas in the city you see all those people competing against each other, being all in equally bad positions. In the, in the forest, however, he sees, oh, come on, those trees, they have to compete against each other and kill each other, well, to de deprive each other of light in order to flourish themselves. Oh, my God, well, here and out. Again. Well, of course it is a joke about the Victorians, but it gives you the idea how, they, uh, how uneasy they were with nature. Uh, or, well, let's say more uneasy than the Romantics. Uh, uh, again, nature is not an inspiration for the Romantic poets. Rather, it is something that you oppose something that you conquer, something that you subdue. And in colonial poetry, for example, in Kipling's writing, we see this very vividly in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the portrayal of the Englishman as a soldier, as a colonial service worker, as, let's say, a white person on the black continent, subduing the local whatever it is there. And, well, and doing them good, because they'll subdue you, it's for your own good, guys. It's for your own good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, Tennyson's emotion is recollected in regret. So, Tennyson is 
looking at nature and regretting, whereas for the romantic uh, romantics, uh, nature is something that gives you the the sense of tranquility. Uh, again, um, uh, if we step a bit aside from Tennyson, who, whose early poems are mostly dramatic monologues, uh, we we should look at a person who took the dramatic monologue, something that the Victorians liked a lot, like for example in Dover Beach, uh, and look at Robert Browning, who at, at the time was considered to be Tennyson's main rival, so it was always Tennyson versus Browning, uh, and um, and see that in in Browning's poetry we have a slightly different shade of melancholy and a slightly different attitude to love. Uh, to love. So, in, in Browning's poetry, especially in the poem uh, Mariana, again published in 1850, so it appears the same age as in Memoriam, and hence they are often looked at together. We see a note of despair, well, uh, oh, as we have an abandoned heroine, obviously Mariana, uh, uh, writing about her, uh, uh, well, well, waiting for her beloved. Uh, well, obviously, if, well, you definitely, well, noted that uh, the name and obviously the motive is taken from uh, one of Shakespeare's plays. So in uh, so in Mariana also. Okay. So um, uh, uh, so in Mariana we have this dramatic man look of a woman waiting for for the man, as well as in Ulysses and uh, Tithonus. Uh, so Browning, unlike Tennyson, draws not on the things that he sees very much like the Romantics, rather he looks back at the uh, Greek and Roman themes and Greek and Roman uh, imagery, and well, like Ulysses for example, and, and tries to rethink them within the aesthetics of the Victorian age. So he, uh, so he retells the myth so that the his contemporaries would understand it. I mean understand not in the sense who did what, but uh, understand the more uh, the moral the morality behind their actions, pretty much in that sense. So uh, oh, oh, again in uh, a, uh, a slight change in Tennyson's writing happens uh, very, very quickly, already in 1852, and, well, in well, and later in 53. So it's the time of the Crimean War, so probably the first war after the Napoleonic War, which was, record, we, uh, which was photographed, so we have actual wartime photography from the period, and the first war which was fought on a uh, let's call it on a global scale, in a sense that we would understand a war now. So you have a kind of political problem, you send your forces overseas, and you fight a war somewhere far, far away. Very much like, um, um, well, modern wars are fought in, say, in Iraq or Syria or wherever. In 1852, he writes a poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade, which uh, features one of the most striking episodes of the Crimean War, of the mass heroism of the English Light Brigade, which charged against the Russian positions. Uh, well, there was no need in this attack. They were, well, the attackers were, would, of course, die because it was an attack that wasn't planned, it was done out of sheer heroism and done for, 
well, just to uh, impress the public, just for PR. Uh, and it showed how pointless war can be and how pointless the heroism in the war is. And this is a slightly different ethos. It is a slightly different uh, emotion that is behind them. Of course it's sadness, of course it's melancholy, but it's a different sort of melancholy. Uh, here's the, here is the extract. All the value of death wrote the 600. Someone had blundered theirs not to make reply, theirs not to reason why, theirs to do and die. So, well, you send people there, they, they, don't, they can't ask why, they can't say, oh, hold on, there's no point in us going there, we don't want to die. Well, there's no point in us dying, we just won't achieve anything. Well, but these people simply go and die. And this struck Tennyson, and it was something that the Victorian, well, early Victorian poets were very much struck by. And... Uh, this note of courage against all odds in the, is the beginning of the characteristic stiff upper lip behavior. So keeping appearances well, so that your lips don't tremble. You just go there, you are tough. So, uh, and this became to be seen as a typifying British emotions. So, here we have this sharp contrast between earlier Victorians with in memoriam, with very passionate poems, and later Victorians, where, where there is no place in emotion for, for emotion in poetry. Yeah. Mm. Again, we, uh, uh, we see how this sentimentality uh, starts to disappear from other kinds of writing. It, it is retained, of course, in Dickens' writing. And for example, in Old Curiosity Shop, we still have it. We have this emotion, uh, emotional element in, in The Christmas Carol, in, a, well, in David Copperfield. But we, we start seeing less and less and less of it in poetry. So, if the novel can still keep it, the poetry, unfortunately, male poetry, male current poetry, cannot retain the sentiment. It be, uh, uh, so sentimentality becomes something that male poetry is not fit for. Uh, again, um, uh, the Charge of the Light Brigade, even though was never attempted as a great political and patriotic poem, quickly became viewed as such. Uh, the, uh, it's a striking example how a poem could be read quite differently from what the, its author implied it to be. Uh, since it gave, uh, and it gave rise to, uh, to, uh, to a different uh, well, to a different mode of writing, which we can call the nostalgic heroism. Uh, we, uh, there is a lot of it in uh, Tennyson's Idols of the King, so it is the so-called nostalgic realism. And there is a lot of it, not so particularly nostalgic, but still heroism, in Kipling, especially in If. Uh, if you remember the poem, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing this and blaming it of you, uh, on you, if you can trust your friends when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, and so on and so forth. Uh, if becomes an emblematic Victorian poem in the sense that it conveys all the ideas the Victorians wanted, or, or wanted to convey they represented the emblematic, this, well, this idealized vision of a Victorian boy who is to become a man. So it's a father talking to a man, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing, if you can do this and this and this and this and this, if you can keep the stiff upper lip, you will inherit the world, you will run the world, you will be on, on, on top. So do as you are told and, well, get, get your reward. Uh, in the 19th 
80s, a survey showed that if it was the most popular and best loved poem by general reader in, in Britain. And it very much reflects this late Victorian ethos. Some, uh, mm, uh, something that is completely out of place now, uh, but is still, but still very much defines the British, the contemporary British society, and especially the contemporary British political discourse that, that, that we are now seeing. Uh, again, Kipling uh, here is also worth talking about since he does not only uh, create this ethos, he also develops what is what we can call what, what we can call our air uh, 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 a kind of um, a kind of new poetic dialect, a poetry for somebody uh, who was never ever considered to be a poetic voice. Uh, so he tries to convey uh, using also using dialect, also using very specific syntax, the voice of an ordinary soldier in India, a colonial soldier. Uh, so, and he uses innovative rhythm. Uh, he uses innovative style, well, in terms of using words, uh, which you would normally see in poetry. For example, in uh, his uh, Gun Gadin, uh, in from the Barrack Room Ballads, again the title, Barrack, barrack Room, barrack, where, where soldiers live. You don't have a ballad from a barrack room, yeah? You, you have marches, you have training, but you don't have a ballad, which is a very romantic and very brooding uh, poem. So, the uniform of her was nothing much before. You're a better man than I am, Gun Gadin. Uh, again, we do not we do not see soldiers actually being poetic. However, in, uh, in Kipling, we see this idealized version of, of a colonial soldier, which again fuels this imperial machine, uh, serves the imperial ethos, so we, the British Empire, are there to, to make this planet a better place. Uh, and at the very same time, it shows a, a, a kind of understanding and really good understanding of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, now, however, uh, Kipling is often viewed not as a, uh, as a poet writing about India, but rather somebody expressing colonial sentiment. We can, if, you, if we look at this poem, Keep up the white man's burden, which is again not not the poem you would not normally recite in a multicultural society. But still, again, this is another age of the Victorian, being being relatively harsh on somebody who is not the same as you are. Uh, uh, again, um, uh, if we continue with Tennyson, uh, we will see that Tennyson was very much, if not the, uh, the person who provided the ideology for this sort, of, uh, this sort of ethos, for imperial and colonial ethos, but was a person who, in a sense, capitalized on that going a bit further. So, if you are talking about the colonial spirit, you should definitely go further. Right, so this is the colonies, but where do we come from? Uh, again, each, uh, uh, you know, each literary period wanted to justify its right to say the words, its right to be there. Every, every political regime does this. Uh, so Tennyson looks at, at something that Will, uh, that works for every epoch, something that works for 
every age in British history. He looks at King Arthur. And of course he looks at the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, very much like uh, Thomas Mallory in the Middle Ages, in the 15th century, when writing his Death of Arthur, or Mort d'Arthur, uh, used medieval, well, early medieval legend to, to tell us, oh, the golden age of chivalry is long gone, and we are here in the living a life of misery, where ignorant armies clash by night. Oh, well, pretty, well, um, Somehow Tennyson does pretty much the same trick. Well, if Mallory used uh, King Arthur as, a re as something to reflect upon the Wars of the Roses and to explain the current political situation, uh, Milton, well, with his Paradise Lost, thought about writing a big narrative poem after the Civil War, rethinking the Civil War. Tennyson um, does this uh, somehow out of the blue. Uh, well, it seems so at least. However, uh, there was a very good reason for, uh, for him to write this. So Tennyson's Death of Arthur comes from 1855 when England was desperately searching for its history and for its identity. So, what is, what is it like to be British? Or what it is like to be English? Again, a very tough question, still very difficult to answer now. And Tennyson thought, well, we are something that was constructed by King Arthur. So, we are very, very, well, we come from a very, we have a very decent background. <laughs> so we are, uh, again, with uh, what is more, he, um, uh, uh, he uses uh, King Arthur as this, um, as this vessel of all those good Victorian virtues that should be there and which should be observed. So, uh, uh, this all made Tennyson uh, the poet laureate, meaning the poet that writes on special occasions for the monarch and made him the key poet of the period. Uh, at the very same time, uh, on the other edge, we have Robert Browning, whose monologues quite diff are quite different from Tennyson's in terms of style. So. Uh, if, uh, if Tennyson follows the tradition set by Spencer, Milton, and Keats, so we have those long, very elaborate monologues, very much like in Paradise Lost. In Browning, we see a slightly different tradition. We see this brooding monologue in very much like in Shakespeare or in John Donne. So in, in a sense, Browning asks us the same question as Hamlet asked himself, to be or not to be? And goes on thinking, yes, but, no, but. And this, dial and this internal dialogue is something that we see in Robert Browning. So, it's a slightly different sort of tradition. It's a tradition set by Shakespeare and John Donne, and which will persist later in the Victorian era. Again, we have very much the same observant and really brooding uh, monologues in Matthew Arnold, for example, in Dover Beach. Uh, one more important thing about Browning is that he, unlike Tennyson, looks at love. And at love not only in its very romantic sense, but also in its very central sense. Uh, his a uh, letter exchange with the wife, <coughs> Elizabeth Barrett, uh, was published. Well, they published it themselves, so all those letters that they exchanged, sometimes very, very frank letters, they were published. And this was a kind of scandal, but say, look, we can do this, we are poets, and we talk openly about love and sensual aspects of love, and so on. <laughs> and again, in, um, uh, Browning too looks at the Arthurian legend, at King Arthur, but 
looks at it from a slightly gloomier perspective. Uh, uh, for, uh, for example, in, uh, in, in his uh, in some of uh, in some of his poems, he uh, simply says, "Well, I well, there I come. There was the woman I loved, but somehow I started to hate her and I strangled her and killed her. And we sat there motionless, both of us. I was well. She didn't say it because she was dead. I didn't say it because I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Well, you do not write poems about killing women in the in the Romantic era." Especially the women, the women you love. However, Browning said, well, look, sometimes violence and love, they come in, in, in pairs. And very often love and, uh, and violence are closely knit together. Well, remember Othello from, uh, from Shakespeare. Again, we, we see it there. And again, it's a rethinking of, of the traditional... A theme of loving and killing because of love. Uh, so, to uh, uh, the last person, but not in the bad sense, to, to talk about would be uh, Matthew Arnold uh, with his Dover Beach, which is again a very striking poem, which in a sense embodies the whole of the uh, of the Victorian <coughs> sentiment, especially the end of the Victorian era. Uh, Matthew Arnold, apart from being a poet, was also a great thinker. Uh, well, I wouldn't, I don't want to say a philosopher, but again, he was a person who wrote on current affairs. And uh, Mm, in, uh, in, in the 1860s he writes a, well I would call it a treatise, a pamphlet a well, kind of a text well, we can call it a book of it uh, Culture and Anarchy and in, in this lovely uh, booklet he writes our society distributes itself into barbarians Philistines and populace. Populace like people in the bad sense. Talpa. The pursuit of perfection then is the pursuit of sweetness and light. Philistine gives the notion of something particularly stiff-necked and perversive in the resistance to light and its children. And therein it especially suits our middle class. In other words, uh, Arnold reads Darwin's The Origin of Species, which is about the evolution. Yeah, you, 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 you're, you're more, uh, more or less aware about Darwin. Yeah, so according to Darwin, the species that survive are the survive who survives there. Come on, not the strongest, though. No the ones that are best suited for their conditions they live in. And people are thinking, right, is the evolution going on now, while we are living? And the question was, well, certainly yes, it does. But then people thought, right, but are we evolving to become better? Because, as a, uh, as a brother of Darwin pointed out, those people who are best in terms of education, in terms of their upbringing, in terms of their culture, seem to be not so numerous as those below who give birth to numerous children who live in poverty, poverty and who, well, do all sorts of nasty things, who drink alcohol, who, well, beat up their children and wives, who are ignorant. So. It is a problem. Maybe it is not an evolution. Maybe it's a devolution. And this was something that Arnold was deeply worried by. So our society thinks uh, thinks Arnold is something that is developing into a uh, into a a group which is not going to be better, but is going to be worse. Or what shall we do? Uh, 
and he very uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, points out that we should do something about culture. Culture is important. So if we if we don't promote high culture, especially our society will go down to this barbarian state. Again, that was culture and anarchy. Our if we look at Dover Beach, we, we see exactly the same sentiment there. The world which seems to lie before us like the land of dreams, so very, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help, nor, nor help for pain. Again, and uh, thus, uh, it is not the... Uh, it would be wrong to see uh, Matthew Arnold as somebody who is against ordinary people. No, 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 no. He's not a fascist. He's not something like something of the kind. Rather, he and Mary, many of later Victorian poets, uh, especially Thomas Hood, uh, use poetry as a vehicle of social criticism. Uh, Hood. Who is, a, who is mostly known as uh, who is mostly known as an author of humorous short poems for children wrote in 1843 a very striking poem uh, called Song of the Shirt shirt like about a woman sewing a shirt and this poem is a striking example uh, example of uh, of the poor conditions ordinary people have to live in and have to have to work their living. Uh, well, here is it's a very short it's a shortish poem. With fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman, woman with capital letter, sat in an in unwomanly rags plying her needle and thread, stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger and dirt, and still with the voice of a dolorous speech, she sang the song of the shirt, work, 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 while the, the cock is growing aloof, and work, 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 till the stars shine through the roof. Again, if you, if you have stars shining through the roof, well, basically you have some problems with your roof. Uh, well, there are holes there. Again, it is a very, uh, it's a poem you would not normally see in the, in the Romantic period. Victorian poetry is about social criticism. Sometimes it is very straightforward as in the Song of the Shirt. Sometimes it is more subtle, like in Dover Beach. Uh -huh. uh, uh, another, uh, another important aspect of Victorian poetry is this very peculiar combination of pessimism and optimism. On the one hand, you, uh, you have this optimism from uh, all technological advances. On the other hand, well, the society becomes better. On the other hand, you see the social problems that are there. And you do not know where it is all going. Uh, as a result, by the end of the, uh, of the 19th century, by the death of Queen Victoria, the poetic life, I mean, uh, poetry as a genre, was in a sense of crisis. Uh, the new age did not did not like the aesthetics of the Victorian era simply because it did not focus on the beauty of the language and of life as such. Uh, especially you see this you know, if you look at pre-Raphaelite -re -pre painting and pre-Raphaelite poetry, where, which doesn't bother much about social inequality, which uh, looks at art and, and literature as something that should embody beauty. I mean abstractly, abstract beauty. So it should be beautiful, it should not make a big statement. 
And from this movement in the Victorian era, uh, we, uh, from, this, from this tiny spring, we, uh, we see the, uh, the birth of Oscar Wilde. I mean, not, not literally as a person, but of Oscar Wilde as an aesthetic. Uh, a person who is mostly focused not on the moral side of his uh, writing, but rather on the beauty of writing itself. And later we see modernism with uh, Joyce and Wolf and D. H. Lawrence who, looking at the social problem and the social issue in uh, of, uh, touched upon the Victorian poets and novelists, develop this into a more personal, more, uh, how to put it, uh, uh, more first point of view, vision of life. If the Victorians put the society at the heart of their writing, so they were trying to address big ideas, like in Dover Beach, where, uh, where the poet tries to give a world view of the world going down and collapsing, where ignorant time is clashed by night. Uh, here, we, uh, in, in modernism, we try, uh, well, the modernists at least, they try to look at a single person who is among those clashing armies uh, and not, not knowing what to do.